Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In McCurtain County in Oklahoma, I have many sightings or near meetings with Bigfoot as I lived in McCurtain County the first 24 years of my life. It was a wooded area with a stream running through it. After the county fair each year, Bigfoot always came and slept in the barn where the cattle auction was held. We saw him come out and began to approach us, and of course we ran. We would go into the barn during the day and find chicken remains. We usually went on the weekend. Usually he would be there, but a few times he wasn't there. We never told anyone because we knew they would not believe us. I've heard him many times when we lived Itabel and Broken Bow until I married and moved to Dallas, Texas. There is a place just outside of Itabel where I believe he lives. You can always expect to hear him, and he will approach you if you happen to be walking or maybe have a breakdown on this particular road. There are too many encounters on this road about someone or something coming around. We walked through this area in the day and a couple of times at night, and he has followed us. There is a stream that goes through this area, and I believe he lives around this stream. We heard him screaming one day out there, and he stayed in the trees, but we could hear him moving about. Kinfolk have come from Lofton Field, and he chased them as they rode their bikes after the game was over and the lights were turned out. I've heard about Bigfoot since I can remember. The closest water to this area of sighting would be the Little River. On to the next one. In Pontotoc County in Oklahoma, I was eight years old and we just moved to the country that had lots of woods all around the house. We had a little camper I played in. I had several chihuahuas and a Rottweiler. Well, one day, I was playing in the camper, and the dogs were barking, running just a little ways from where I was. I decided to follow them. What came after us was cute. It was a little fawn. I was going to chase it, but I saw this huge, smelly, eight-foot-tall, red mud clay colored thing. As little as I was, I thought it was a tall man until I hollered, hey, who are you? He looked at me and his face was so ugly and scary. I knew then he wasn't a man. He stepped right over a five foot five fence. The little fawn ran right under it. He didn't catch the fawn. I was in shock and I couldn't speak so my dad told me to draw what I saw. He said it looked similar to a Sasquatch. That deer season, my dad was deer hunting. He had a deer right next to him. He was about to shoot him, and he heard something coming toward him. The buck ran off. Dad stood up and yelled, You scared my deer off. You're on my land. He heard a high-pitched sound like a lion and a bull mixed together and heard branches breaking over his head. He ran to the house and got both my brothers. They each got a gun. My mom called the sheriff, and he thought it was a prank, but they sent a deputy anyway. When he heard these sounds, he said, call me if you kill it, and left. Now it was dark. The sun had set, so they gave up. The rest of the night, it paced back and forth, making that high-pitched sound. The Bigfoot killed two missing goats. He usually comes back every deer season in the fall. The sighting was just me. Those who heard it were my mom, dad, both brothers, and my sister, the deputy, my grandpa, and both of my aunts. The afternoon was sunny with no wind. The area was heavily wooded with lots of deer in a creek bottom near the river. He was standing in a wash. 
When you go to the river, there is a hole in the big drainage system. It smelled just like him. It's as tall as he is. Around the corner where my grandma lives, they heard something digging in their trash, and its smell was like sewage. On to the next one. In Cleveland County, in Oklahoma, Lake Thunderbird is a little river preserve and very wooded on one side of the river near Franklin Road. I went fishing with a friend at Lake Thunderbird about six years ago. We started fishing in the afternoon. As the day went on, we stayed till it got into the evening. As we were fishing later in the evening, me and my friend started hearing strange noises from the other side of Little River, which runs into the lake. It sounded like a very large man breathing, and it was getting closer to us. Then me and my friend started to notice the animals around us were going the other way from the noise. It made me think that there is something out there and it's coming this way. I started to get very nervous because we could hear branches breaking and it was getting closer to the other side of the river. I became real nervous when my friend said, look at all the birds flying the opposite way and in a hurry. Then we heard a loud splash in the water and we figured it was about time to go. That something was very upset with our presence in the area. I told all my friends about it and they thought I was crazy and to this day I have never been back in that area to fish. I've grown up in the south side of Oklahoma all my life towards the lake and I've never heard anything like that before and will never forget the sound it made and the animals running away. I also noticed the branches. I could see on the other side of the river, breaking above my head, and I knew there was nothing I'd ever seen that could do that. It was a typical fall night, but not too cold yet. A lot of people say they heard noise outside at night in that area. It is a deep river and on a known deer hunting area. On to the next one. In Choctaw County in Oklahoma, my cousins and I were spotlighting one night to find coyotes. We were driving alongside a tree line when we spotted eyes shining in the light about 150 feet away next to the trees. I had binoculars and one of my cousins had a 22 Magnum with a scope. We had a very good view of a large biped covered with brown hair, except for white patches on the chest and one of its arms. It was about eight feet tall or more. It tilted its head down because of the light, but stayed in place for about five minutes, then stepped across the fence on the tree line and disappeared into the woods. The face was like a man and an ape. There were four or five witnesses. We were all riding in a pickup truck. I was 18. They ranged in age from 12 to 16. It was a clear, calm night between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. It was in a clear pasture next to a heavily wooded area. It's not the first around here. It was my second sighting, and I have pictures of footprints somewhere. On to the next one. In the Chickasaw National Recreation Area, which is quite easy to find as it is the only national park in Oklahoma, it is located in the city of Sulphur, off Highway 7 in Murray County in Oklahoma. It was Halloween night. I had taken my younger brother, a high school senior at the time, to Veterans Lake inside the Chickasaw National Recreation Area because some of his friends from the high school band were going to meet that night to try to see the Lady of the Lake, a local myth. As we went to the lake, I was rather preoccupied with the conversation I was having with my brother, so I did not pay close attention to the events going on around us, if any. After dropping him off to hang out with his friends, I left to return home. 
As I drove back down toward the 12th Street entrance to the park, I drove over the Rock Creek Bridge, which crosses Rock Creek just a few yards south of the Rock Creek campgrounds. As I drove over the low water bridge, I saw a figure squatted at the edge of the creek about 20 yards east, downriver from the bridge. It was quite large, at least four and a half to five feet tall in the squatted position. I drove on down a little ways and turned the car around. I went back to the bridge and pulled to where my headlights would shine down the creek as well as possible. It was still there. It was on the balls of its feet with its hands in the water. The creature was huge and hairy. The dark hair was shiny in the car light, but it was hard to make out the exact color. For what was only a few seconds, I'm sure, but seemed like at least 15 minutes, I watched the creature. It did not even glorify my presence with a glance. It merely rose up, walked across the creek, up the bank, and off into the trees. What amazed me the most was that there are streetlights along that park road, and the city of Sulphur is only about a half a mile away. There are streetlights nearby, and I used my car light to see the creature better. The weather was quite chilly, as it was late autumn. I remember a very cool breeze blowing that night. The park has large areas of woodlands, Pines, plus it is close to the Arbuckle Mountains. On to the next one. My husband and I had heard about Babyfoot Lake, a beautiful circular mountain lake near the Illinois Valley in Oregon. And since we were in the Cave Junction area for a few days visiting relatives, we needed some time to ourselves, so we decided it would be nice to go there. We packed a picnic lunch, thinking we would spend some time at the lake, relaxing since it was early enough in the year, that it should be rather devoid of people, what with traces of snow still lingering in pockets. As luck would have it, we were the only car at the trailhead, so we put on our backpacks, grabbed our hiking poles, and we started off on the trail. It seemed different than the written descriptions and directions we had looked at on the internet, as we found ourselves leaving the small valley and climbing at a steady angle alongside a steep cliff. We finally realized that we must have missed the gentle trail that led to Babyfoot Lake. We had looked at maps before leaving the car, and we knew there was a higher trail so we assumed that this must have been what we were on. We figured that the steep trail must eventually meet up with the other trail to the lake, so we decided to stay the course since we could see boot prints had already been on the trail this season. Well, we began regretting our choice after another half an hour because we were still climbing and at places the trail was just wide enough for a person's foot one foot in front of the other. The way down wasn't quite straight, but if you slipped, it was about 100 to 150 feet before a tree or a bush or maybe a huge boulder would stop your fall. Finally, we reached the top of a ridge and the trail continued through the remnants of a forest along the crest of the ridge. There were still many dead, blackened trees from the biscuit fire that raged through the Calmiopus wilderness and burned thousands of acres across these mountains. We had watched a documentary about this tremendous fire, and its ravages were still so visible. It must have been terrible. There were also signs of recovery, but with young trees and small bushes, growing, but they were dwarfed by the huge dead pines that covered the mountains like gray ghosts, with their arms outstretched as if asking for sympathy. Many of them still had pine cones that kind of burned right into the branches. We finally reached the very top of a ridge where someone had piled rocks to form a cairn, which at the time we hadn't researched enough to know what it signified. 
Not far from this spot was our first sight of Baby Foot Lake. Several hundred feet below us, the trail led forward and looked as if it curved down and around the mountain to the lake. It seemed more like a jeep road as it was wide and rutted from what we could see before it dropped downward. We decided to take a lunch break with an overview of the deep blue pool. So we settled on a couple of boulders and began to unpack our sandwiches and water and enjoy the beautiful spring day. Suddenly, we heard a loud thump, and as we both turned, a large, softball-sized rock came skipping along the ground past us and disappeared over the cliff. Knowing we were on the highest point of the ridge, we knew it couldn't have fallen. It had to have been thrown, and we both yelled at the same time. There was no response, and not a sound, but the wind whispering through the pines. We yelled again, but without any response. The angle the rock had landed and rolled forward indicated that it came from the trees just where the trail started downhill, and that meant it had traveled over 150 feet through the air before it hit the ground. We both know that anything that could throw a rock that large, that far, had to be too big to fool around with. We took the easy and safe route by packing up and heading back the way we had come. The hair was standing up on the back of our neck the entire way down the trail, but we didn't hear or see anything further. By the time we got to where the lower trail was visible, we had both lost our interest in visiting the lake for now. So we made our way back to the parking area and were comforted by the sight of our car. On to the next one. Two employees of a campground were spending the evening together after work, sitting at the edge of a lake and trying to relax. A bizarre UFO then came into view and interrupted this relaxation. The craft hovered over the lake and then proceeded to come so close that the campground workers could see directly inside its cockpit. Furthermore, they could see that its pilots weren't human. This incident took place on August 7, 1968, at a summer camp situated on Lake Champlain in the state of Vermont. It involved two of the camping staff, 16-year-old Michael and 19-year-old Janet. The two were taking a brief break from their labors one evening, relaxing on a dock on the lake, when Michael pointed out a particularly bright object on the horizon. It was so bright, he figured it must not be a star, but some other celestial object, maybe Venus. He mentioned as much to Janet, and when the object suddenly dropped from the sky, he shouted, Wow, Venus is falling! The UFO then took on a cigar-type shape, shining brightly as it began its approach to the dock, as the two sat transfixed by the spectacle that was emerging before them. Three bright lights came out of the cigar-shaped craft. The cigar-shaped mothership then reversed course and left the three smaller crafts behind. These three remaining crafts then proceeded to put on a show for Michael and Janet as they looked on in absolute amazement. They zigzagged through the air at impossible speed and then seemed to float like leaves falling gently from the trees. Michael couldn't believe what he was seeing. He almost had to pinch himself to make sure that it wasn't some sort of dream. The objects then advanced on them, coming in much nearer to the dock, so close that they could make out the actual structure of the craft. They were dome-shaped and circular. The crafts were tipping back and forth in wild, oscillating movements. The objects then suddenly ceased their impossible aerobics and entered a triangle formation hovering in midair. Then, suddenly, the ones on the left and the right side of the triangle abruptly departed, leaving just one object behind. This object 
then moved toward Michael and Janet, as what Michael described as the sound of thousands of different tuning forks erupted from it. The UFO moved to the midpoint of Lake Champlain before heading straight for Michael and Janet as it continued to make odd audio emissions. Michael says that at this point, his curiosity turned to fear as he began to get the distinct impression that the object and its occupants were stalking them like prey as they sat on the docks. As his terror grew, he turned to Janet and informed her, I think we should go. But to his frustration and astonishment, Janet was no longer responsive. Like a zonked-out zombie, she just continued to stare up at the craft, seemingly not even able to move a muscle. She was in a complete trance-like state. Michael felt that if he was going to get her off that dock, he would have to physically drag her, because she just did not seem to be able to move on her own. The objects stopped right in front of them. It was close enough for Michael to observe a pulsating rainbow of colors that lit up the entire edge of the craft. The craft then abruptly shot up into the air before coming back down to slam into the water. When it reemerged, it proceeded to move in closer to the dock where Michael and Janet were seated. As it neared, Michael was able to make out figures moving around in the transparent dome of the craft when it finally halted. Just 50 or 60 feet from the dock, Michael was able to get quite a good look at the occupants. They seemed small in stature and had large heads with no visible hair, with a slick kind of sheen. Their complexion was a strange blue-green, offset by a set of large almond-shaped eyes situated on each side of their head. Furthermore, Michael observed that the beings had just two small openings for nostrils and very tiny openings for a mouth. Their heads rested on inordinately long necks that were craning and bobbing about as the beings apparently tried to get a good view of their prey. Michael and Janet sitting on the docks. The beings indeed seemed just as curious about Michael and Janet as they were about them. Michael described their movements as being asked to be inquisitive, frivolous, and childlike as the creatures scampered about the deck of the craft to get a better look at him and Janet. The description of the aliens moving in an exaggerated, almost cartoonish fashion is one that has turned up in UFO literature countless times. Many contend that these descriptions indicate creatures that are used to an environment with less gravity. Despite the aliens' apparent lack of hostility, Michael's fear at being hunted down and captured reemerged, and he screamed out loud at the aircraft, What do you want? Where are you from? Are you going to hurt us? This, to his astonishment, he immediately heard a reply as an alien voice spoke directly into his mind. We are not here to harm you. Michael's mind responded to the invasive mental voice. What is this? I've never done this before. At which he heard the alien tell him, this is what you call telepathy. Michael then mentally asked the beings addressing him. Where are you from? The creature responded with an unintelligible word that Michael took to be the name of the home planet. Michael, still sitting at the end of the dock with his feet dangling over the water, felt overwhelmed by the incredible nature of the encounter that was unfolding. He slapped his knee and laughed in disbelief. To his amazement, the creature that was communicating with him mirrored his gesture and slapped its own knee in complete imitation of Michael's shock disposition. Shortly thereafter, the craft moved to just over their heads, and Michael made the impulsive decision to jump into the air in an effort to touch it. He missed it by a few feet before falling back down on the dock. Right at this moment, a blinding spotlight was emitted from the bottom of the UFO, shining right down on him and Janet. Fearing they were under some sort of attack, Michael scooped Janet up into his arms and tried to brace for the worst. 
It was then that he began to receive the distinct impression that they were about to be rounded and captured by the occupants of this UFO. As he clutched onto Janet's paralyzed form even tighter, he screamed out loud, No, we don't want to go. There was a blinding flash of light, and Michael lost consciousness with only a vague recollection of experiencing a floating sensation just prior to passing out. The next thing he consciously remembered was he and Janet lying back on the dock. It was now pitch black outside, indicating that several hours had passed and that the UFO was long gone. Scared and confused, the two went back to the campground. Although Janet had no recollection of the events whatsoever, Michael could still remember seeing the craft and the occupants shortly before passing out, and the fact that he couldn't account for the missing time in between would haunt him for years. So much so that one day, while he was perusing his older brother's Playboy magazine, he came upon an article about UFOs that included contact information for famed UFO investigator J. Allen Hynek. He immediately gave the famed researcher a call. He was directed to a fellow investigator named Walter N. Webb, who was immediately interested in taking up Michael's case. Webb had Michael contact Janet and then had both of them sent off to two separate professional hypnotists in an effort to retrieve their lost memories. During Michael's hypnosis session, vivid images began to emerge of him standing aboard the alien craft and looking out through a view panel at the Earth, Moon, and Stars, apparently an indication that he had been taken into outer space. Michael recalls then looking down into a lower deck where he could clearly see Janet, completely helpless and nude, prostate on some sort of examining table, in his hypnotic state, he went on to claim that one of the aliens was standing over Janet and intently staring directly into her eyes. In the standard alien abduction lore, this is a technique that has been referred to as a mind scan. It seems that the E.T. have some sort of ability to scan a person's consciousness and sift through their memories simply by staring directly into their retinas. With this E.T. engaging in this sort of alien stare-down, the other alien was busy scraping skin samples off of Janet's arms, as well as taking a blood sample. Even more disturbing, however, Michael then witnessed a triangle-shaped device quickly descend from the ceiling and begin to probe her more delicate areas. At this point, with his rage and indignation rising up within him at the thought of his friend being subjected to such egregious invasive examination, Michael turned to the aliens standing near him and demanded they stop what was happening. These creatures were unmoved, however, and clinically informed him that it was simply a necessary procedure in order to extract ova. Even under hypnosis, Michael's memory gets a little bit foggy at this point, and either through fear or alien intervention, he once again lost consciousness. The next thing he could recall was waking up on his own exam table. His personal scrapings and probing had apparently been finished up while he slumbered, and he was led out of the examination room and onto another area of the ship where other aliens awaited his arrival. Michael was then placed in a chair where some sort of headgear was placed on his head. It's unclear what the purpose of this apparatus was, but the results were well received. Michael says that while he wore this piece of equipment, the aliens eagerly monitored a screen of some sort, and after seeing the results, they actually broke into enthusiastic applause. The story then takes a strange, almost Matrix-like turn, as Michael claims the whole backdrop of the ship suddenly changed into a bizarre landscape of trees and rivers under a purple sky. It was as if he were immersed in some sort of virtual reality, and perhaps that really was the application of this alien headgear. He then became aware of several other human beings meandering around in a kind of sleepwalking state. That's when he noticed Janet standing among them. But unlike the other dazed human, Janet was now conscious, 
and she seemed to be absolutely terrified and sobbing uncontrollably. After being subject to this real or virtually generated image, Michael recalls the ground beneath him fading away and falling toward a spinning globe that appeared to be composed of television monitors. As he neared the surface of this TV globe, he saw that each of the television monitors had a picture up of him and Janet lying unconscious on the dock with a UFO hovering over their prostate forms. Michael braced himself for what seemed like an imminent crash through these screens, but instead of shattering glass, he envisioned, he went smoothly right through the surface of one of the monitors and woke up lying on the dock next to Janet with the UFO above him, just as the odd globe of images had depicted. Michael then received a parting message from the aliens as he heard a voice address him with a goodbye, Michael. Meanwhile, during Janet's hypnosis session, she recalled events nearly identical to those which Michael remembered, making the case a very credible, unexplained sighting. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!